Uh, I will probably skip several details. Nevertheless, I will certainly like to introduce some ideas. Uh, the reason is that they are really important. And um, sometimes these topics are considered to be advanced topics, which is really unfortunate because um, relativistic quantum theory means it's uh, Dirac formulated this in 1928. So nobody over here was born at that time, including me, who is older than everybody else. Um, so this is really uh, not really modern in some sense. Okay, it's, it has been there for a long time. And it is important that our students who will be competing with others in their age group are familiar with these techniques because otherwise they will not be able to compete uh, in international science. So uh, these need to be introduced. And once again, I will uh, like to thank the NPTEL uh, administration, the leadership and the technology support, which is absolutely superb. And um, uh, we, we had some introduction to topics in atomic physics. Uh, Dr. Arvin told you how to do spectroscopy with quantum mechanics and how quantum mechanics actually takes you, uh, enables you to do, uh, carry out observations and understand the physical universe around us because that's what spectroscopy is about. So um, one thing I would like to point out is um, relativistic quantum mechanics because there is often a belief that quantum mechanics is important for tiny objects, microscopic objects. Relativity is important for those objects which are moving very fast, um, every, not at the speed of light, nothing goes at the speed of light except light itself, but at objects which go at what we call as relativistic speeds like 0.6 times the speed of light or 0.8 times the speed of light and so on. Now both of these notions are incorrect because quantum mechanics is applicable to everything no matter what the size is. When we introduced quantum mechanics, we said that okay, it is because you cannot measure position and momentum, you know, these are not compatible. Did we say that what is the size of the object? What is the volume of the object? What is the mass of the object? We never refer to these parameters. And therefore, quantum mechanics is applicable to everything, to this object, to large sized objects like you and me, including me, which is larger than anybody else. And also, the Earth itself, the galaxies, and you can write the Schrodinger equation for a galaxy and do astronomy using quantum theory because it is not at all a requirement that quantum mechanics should be used only for microscopic objects, for all the macroscopic phenomena, for everything that happens over here, quantum mechanics is, a, is applicable. Not only applicable, it is necessary. It is mandatory, it is required. The reason you are sitting on your chairs and not falling through the floor, for example, is because of certain interactions at the floor and these interactions for their completeness require a quantum description, okay? There are electrons and charges in the floor material, in your feet and so on, and unless all the interactions between them are correctly taken into account, which includes the Coulomb interaction, they include the exchange interaction, the Fermi Dirac statistics, okay? So unless all of these interactions are taken into account correctly, you will not be able to account for the fact that this object is not falling through the table. Okay, so quantum mechanics is applicable to everything. Likewise, relativity is applicable to everything, not just to objects which are moving at relativistic speeds. If an object is at rest, it doesn't mean that it is free from relativistic effects. I mentioned the sodium atom spectrum, the spin orbit splitting between the 3p, 3 half, on the 3p one half level, that splitting will hold good for a sodium atom even if you bring it to a halt, okay? In laser cooling, that's what you do. You bring an alkali atom to some sort of a rest or as close to rest as you can get, and it will have the spin orbit splitting, and there is no way you can account for the spin of an electron 
without relativistic effects. So these are some of the things that I would like to highlight uh, very quickly. So you have the Schrodinger equation over here. And the Schrodinger equation, as you can see, has got the distance term. Okay, V is a function of R. And distance undergoes Lorentz contraction. Okay, so the Schrodinger equation is not Lorentz invariant. And that is the reason you need a relativistic formulation of quantum mechanics. So you already realize that you need state vectors to describe the state of a system. But then you also need the evolution of the state of the system to be described by an equation which is relativistically invariant, which is Lorentz invariant, which is what for electrons is the Dirac equation. And events then take place in a four-dimensional world, which we often call as the Minkowski world or the space-time continuum. So I will not be going through all of this in details because we are toward the end of the day, but all of these points are discussed at considerable length in the two courses on atomic physics. So in, in different modules, you know, um, so some part is in um, module number three, some in some other module, but if you integrate, you will find all of these ideas discussed at great length. So quantization is not about discreteness, it is about, you know, treating these quantum dynamical variables as operators representing the state of a system by vectors in a Hilbert space, and then developing the algebra further to extract physical properties. And when you do this, you have to also take into account the Lorentz invariant. So when you quantize momentum, and instead of momentum, we introduce the operator gradient, right? Minus i cross gradient was our operator for momentum. And what is momentum? Momentum is mass times velocity, dr by dt. So it is a ratio of space over time, and neither space nor time is Lorentz invariant. Okay? So you have to have a more refined idea about these parameters before you quantize, because quantization will involve having appropriate operators for the momentum, and what would be, the, be these operators um, has, to, has to be introduced correctly and precisely. So it takes a little while to do that, so I, I won't get into these details, but invite you to the full lectures which are integrated um, in this course. So it has got some important consequences. So I let, I'm going to skip uh, several slides, but I would like to highlight one important aspect over here, that if you consider uh, this metric, this P mu, P mu, and this is manifestly Lorentz invariant, and this is what you would use to quantize the system. So the momentum that you will be referring to would be coming from a relationship which is Lorentz invariant. And this has got some important upshots you deal with the mass m. And what is this mass m? Okay, so there is a very famous equation, E equal to mc square, which is not correct. Okay, it, it is not correct. The correct equation is gamma mc square. And you can see this very easily because if you put, if you apply this equation for a photon, which whose rest mass is zero, the E equal to mc square would give zero energy for a photon, and you would wonder what happened to that h nu, which we have been using for the energy of the photon, right? So E equal to mc square is not correct, and one really has to use E equal to gamma mc square, where gamma is root of um, uh, one over root of one minus v square by c square, and then you can expand this um, uh, in, as, as a power series and then get various terms, you get the rest mass and then mm, rest mass energy and then you get uh, the relativistic kinetic energy and so on. So I won't go into these details, but uh, you will find that this E equal to mc square will not give you the correct expression for the photon, but if you use gamma mc square, what does it give you for a photon? For a photon, m is zero, so the numerator goes to zero, but v is equal to c, so the denominator also goes to zero. So it doesn't give you a wrong answer. It gives you an indeterminate quantity. And it tells you that this is not the way to get the energy of the photon. 
okay? Whereas e equal to mc square would give you a wrong answer and an indeterminate answer is a better answer than a wrong answer because when it is indeterminate, we learn that, okay, this is not the way to get the expression for the energy of the photon. What you should do to get the energy of the photon is to use the relativistically invariant relationship and that will give you for the photon E equal to PC and that is no surprise because energy being associated with my initials is no coincidence at all. <laughs> and that is the correct expression for energy. It will give you H nu as you should get, right? So, so one has to do these things very carefully, very rigorously. And some of these things uh, are often skipped out in many courses at the undergraduate level or even in the MSc courses. So I will not uh, go through these details, but then um, we have to, we require a correct equation which is relativistically invariant to describe the state of a system and how it evolves with time, which is the fundamental question in mechanics. And that is done for an electron using the Dirac equation. So let me skip all of this, but let me flash the Dirac equation. Here it is at the very top of the slide. What is in this red box over here is the Dirac equation in what we call as the standard form. And all along we have been saying that the electron has got an angular momentum which we call as the orbital angular momentum. We said that it has nothing to do with an orbit. Okay. What is it? It is an angular momentum which satisfies certain commutation rules. And from that angular momentum, we can get a magnetic moment and you see that magnetic moment in the Zeeman effect, right? And that's not the only magnetic moment you see in the Zeeman effect. You see an additional source of the magnetic moment, which must come from an additional source of angular momentum, which is the spin angular momentum, which we insisted has nothing to do with the kind of spin that you talk about when you talk about the Earth's rotation or the spinning of a top, right? So if electron spin is not spin in this sense, if orbital angular momentum has nothing to do with orbits of this sense, then where does this spin come from? So it comes from the Dirac equation. It comes from the relativistic Dirac equation. And here you have the Dirac equation in front of you. And do you see the spin over here? Do you see the, do you see the spin orbit interaction? The spin orbit interaction, which we used in explaining the Zeeman effect and the anomalous Zeeman effect, there was an S dot L term. Now, where is this S dot L in the Dirac equation? Yet we argue that it is there. And you have to dig into the Dirac equation to find it. Okay? And the way to do this is to carry out certain transformations of the Dirac Hamiltonian. And these transformations are known as foley Wodeisen transformations, which were worked out not so recently, 1950. So there is nothing modern about this. Okay? And this is the quantum mechanics that students really need to learn. There is nothing new about it. There is nothing advanced about it because it is quite old quantum mechanics. It's more than 60 years old. And uh, for any student who is doing a master's in physics, he has to know this so that he can really do some competitive physics, um, which is at the very frontier of research in physics. So when has to be introduced to what are known as the foley wodeisen transformations. And what the foley wodeisen transformations do is to carry out the Dirac equation, which is here. So you write the Dirac equation in a form which looks so similar to that of the Schrodinger equation. But you carry out a transformation, which are known as foley wodeisen transformation. And you carry out a transformation once and twice and three times. And then rewrite the Dirac equation in a form which, in which after three foley wodeisen transformations, the H triple prime, which is the third Hamiltonian in this sense, has got this form. And now you see the sigma dot L or the S dot L spin orbit coupling, and you see the electron spin coming nicely out of the Dirac equation, but not unless you subject it to all of these transformations. So, so these are some of the things that we deal with in these courses on atomic physics and the subsequent uh, follow-up course which is called as the theory of atomic collisions and spectroscopy. So it is abbreviated as TACS for theory of 
atomic collisions and spectroscopy, but it rhymes as tax and students normally say that, okay, it is a course which taxes them. So it is, again, not a coincidence that it is called as tax. So anyhow, we also deal with how an atom is to be probed. Now, can you, uh, if you have a target, whatever, how would you probe it? You will probe it with something, right? So what will you probe it with? You can probe it with light by electromagnetic radiation, or you can fire some particles like electrons, positrons, or anything. So is there anything else that you can think of? Either elementary particles or composite elementary particles like atoms or alpha particles or even molecules, you can fire molecules and so on. And when you do light, you will say that you're doing spectroscopy. When you do it with material particles, you say that you're doing quantum collisions. And these two are actually two facets of essentially the same physics. So spectroscopy and quantum collisions are really not really two separate things. You can see from this picture. So if you look at the final state over here, you have got an ion and an electron. And you can get this final state through electron ion scattering experiment like this. You can also take a neutral atom and photoionize it, okay, an electromagnetic shine, electromagnetic energy on that, and a photon is absorbed, leaves an ion, and an electron is kicked out. So you'll, you'll get a final state in which you have got an ion and an electron, but you, the initial ingredients are completely different. In one case, it is an electron and an ion. In the other case, it is a neutral atom and a photon. So if you come this way, you're doing spectroscopy, if you come this way, you're doing quantum collisions. And it is not surprising that you should have the same final state in this case, because these two processes are related to each other through a symmetry. And this symmetry is what is called as the time reversal symmetry. And it is not the same thing as T going to minus T, as we saw in classical mechanics, but it works all right for classical mechanics. But when you do it in quantum theory, you have to do more than that um, the t going to minus t is usually accompanied by the wave function undergoing complex conjugation. So these are some uh, details that I will not um, um, discuss at length. Uh, we are toward the end of the day, but you have the quantum collision and photonization processes related to each other through time reversal symmetry. Uh, so we deal with quantum collisions uh, the essential idea is how are you, what kind of boundary conditions are you using over there? And there are boundary conditions which are known as outgoing wave boundary conditions and ingoing wave boundary conditions. So you, you often say that e to the ikr by r is a spherically outgoing wave and it is meaningless to say that it is an outgoing wave without specifying what is the time dependence of this wave function? And for a stationary state, it is e to the minus i omega t. So when you plug in the time dependence, you have got the phase which goes as kr minus omega t. And the surface of constant phase will have dr by dt to be a positive quantity so that the radial distance will increase, which is what makes it a spherically outgoing wave. So if you impose the ingoing wave boundary conditions, you can get the solution for quantum collisions so uh, these are determined, they also determine the normalization of the wave function. So these are several aspects that we deal with in these courses. Um, you can write the solutions not just as a differential equation like we do using the Schrodinger equation. You can use the integral equation using the Green's functions for, uh, with appropriate boundary conditions. And when you do that, you get the um, Lippmann-Schwinger equation for potential scattering. Uh, you can develop some approximation schemes like the Bonn approximation, which is not just one approximation, but it is a series of approximations. So it is called as a Bonn series or Bonn approximations, plural, as I like to call it, uh, which comes from this multiple scattering process. So these are some of the details that we discuss. We also get the solution for the Coulomb scattering, for which the usual methods of scattering uh, really break down. Although it is a simple potential, the 1 over r potential is the most common one and the simplest one as we, one might think, but it does require some special techniques using um, uh, solving the problem using parabolic coordinates 
and some techniques from contour integration. So these uh, have also been dealt with in this course. And then we deal with a very fascinating topic, which is that of resonances. And this, I believe, is an extremely important topic. There are different kinds of resonances. There are the shape resonances. There are the final pushback resonances. And the techniques are important not just in atomic physics, but in all branches of physics. In fact, some of these techniques were developed by Wigner in the context of uh, nuclear physics. Uh, there are uh, resonances. And then there is uh, shape analysis of these resonances. Uh, Fano's paper has more citations than most other papers in literature. So the Bright-Wigner relationship for resonances and the Fano analysis and so on. So, so we have dealt with some of these topics. Then uh, these resonance profiles, because they have very many different kinds of shapes, so these can be analyzed using the Fano parameterization of the resonances. We also deal with second quantization because these are powerful techniques and when you deal with a many electron atom, uh, you will need to go beyond the hartree fock to take into account the electron correlations and when it becomes necessary to do that, it becomes important to use methods of second quantization. And then going for approximations is something that you cannot escape from, okay, because if you're dealing in classical mechanics, even with a three-party problem, you do not have analytical solutions, which is why Poincare and so on, they ran into this theory of chaos, okay, the nonlinear dynamics and the whole uh, theory of chaos emerged from the fact that you could not get uh, stability of the three-body system. It became chaotic. So when you deal with quantum phenomena, forget the three bodies, even for one single particle, you need the uncertainty principle and you cannot avoid statistical mechanics for that, okay? So like I said, you need quantum mechanics not just for microscopic phenomena, but they are applicable to objects of all sizes, including Earth, Sun, galaxies. You need relativity not just to deal with objects which are moving at speed of light, but even for objects which are at rest, because an electron at rest will have an intrinsic angular momentum, which is a spin. A sodium atom at rest will have the spin orbit interaction, which will give you the D1, D2 lines, okay? And likewise, you need statistical mechanics, not just because you have a large number of objects and you have to do averaging to get the average properties like temperature and so on as we do in classical thermodynamics, but you need statistical mechanics even for single particles for which you have uncertainty principle, but not just for a single particle, even for vacuum, okay? And Brown said it in his book that if you are looking for exact solutions, having no body at all is already too many. So you need powerful methods and you need methods of second quantization because to get electron correlation, which is a many electron problem, for any atom, an atom will have got n number of electrons, a molecule has those many, a bulk matter, you talk about the electron properties of materials, say that, okay, here is a metal, this is a dielectric, this is an insulator, and so on, and you try to explain it in terms of the chronic penny model, a single particle Schrodinger equation. So there are serious limitations, because even if you take a small piece of any solid, the number of electrons over there, I mean, just think of the Avogadro number, and then every atom will have got so many electrons. So you really have a large number of electrons, and you cannot solve this problem exactly. You need approximation methods. And to develop these approximation methods, you need methods of second quantization. So you work with electron creation and destruction operators, write the Hamiltonian in the second quantized formulation, and then develop these approximations. A very famous approximation is uh, the random phase approximation, which was developed by Bohm and Pines, and people in condensed matter physics may be familiar with it. This is the one which gives rise to these plasma excitations. Okay, so these are the collective oscillations of an electron gas. And uh, these are extremely important in modern uh, technology, in nanoscience and so on. One has to understand these uh, processes. Uh, one also makes use of diagrammatic perturbation theory. There are other ways of getting, uh, developing these approximations using Feynman diagrams and so on. 
which also uh, we provide a brief introduction to. Uh, so we deal with this uh, Bohm-Pines method of canonical transformations. Uh, then we introduce the Dyson chronology operator and so on. So uh, doing the second quantization and using uh, adiabatic switches to control these correlations. So these are fairly sophisticated techniques, but then they are not really modern. They have been there for a long time and anybody who is graduating with a degree in physics with a master of science in physics needs to have a very good acquaintance with these techniques. So these are some of the methods which we introduce for its applications in atomic physics, but they have applications not just in atomic physics, but also in all domains of physics, including nuclear physics, condensed matter physics, and so on. So these are, these, they get to be quite complicated, but then uh, it is not very difficult to handle these terms if you introduce uh, some tricks. And these tricks uh, ap appear in terms of uh, the Feynman diagrams, and they make it uh, very easy to deal with uh, what looks like very complicated terms. So we provide a little bit of introduction to that. So I think I will uh, stop here. But I will be happy to take some questions. And uh, then we will have an open session in which uh, everybody can uh, not just ask questions, but also comment on how uh, some of these things could have been done better. Uh, your suggestions are always welcome. And uh, like uh, Andrew and Pratap said that uh, we, we could, you know, develop uh, collaborative courses for your students in your colleges. So thank you all very much. Uh, we offer physics courses to engineering students. And then we also have programs which train scientists. So the physics department, for example, offers what is called as a dual degree program, which includes a bachelor of science and a master of science. So this is an integrated BSMS program. So the intake is from the JEE, and they do not join a BTEC program, but instead they join a BSMS program. And then we also offer a degree uh, in engineering physics, which is a BTEC in engineering physics, and all the physics courses are offered to them. But a good number of physics courses are taken by engineering students. There are some which are mandatory. Uh, there are some courses which are mandatory, and there are some courses which are elective. But a uh, combination of these courses um, does provide an opportunity to all students whether he's a student of the dual degree program or a student of engineering, to take all kinds of physics courses, which are not just the basic core courses like PH101 and so on, which is taken by everybody, but also electives in atomic physics, condensed matter physics, particle physics, cosmology, string theory. So all of these courses are available to both BSMS students, to BTEC in engineering physics, and also to any student who is doing any engineering degree, including civil engineering, ocean engineering, electrical engineering, no matter what branch he goes for, uh, she or he can take these courses. Any other question? As a matter of fact, the undergraduate teaching is a very large uh, part of uh, the teaching program at IIT Madras and one of the programs which we all enjoy very much. <laughs> actually a difference with IIT and IIT. IIT has a very small number of undergraduate yes. programs. Yes, yes, yes. So we have a very strong component of undergraduate teaching. It's a lot of work and a lot of fun. Any other question or comment? Was the lunch all right? <laughs> well, you need to give us some feedback. <laughs> so you, please, please feel free to comment on anything, uh, whether it was the lunch or the coffee or the lectures or uh, anything. So.
Actually, yes. Um, the NPTEL has already prepared these certificates and I think you just have to collect them from the administrative staff. Uh, these certificates are ready, I believe. And uh, before you leave the premises, do pick up your participation certificate. And I want to personally thank all, each one of you for spending your entire day over here. I realize that it may have been tiring, um, but I certainly enjoyed it. And I hope that you will have something nice to take back home. Sir, are you going to conduct uh, for other disciplines also like this? Awareness? Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure that NPTEL is interested in reaching out to the physics faculty, or not just to physics, but also to other disciplines, because there are courses in other branches of science and engineering, and also fine arts like English literature, even music, you have seen that there are some courses. So yes, NPTEL uh, will be making some of the other, some of the other attempt. And uh, Pratap and uh, Andrew have already given some idea about it. And uh, they will be the best person to contact for details. But I'm sure they do have uh, a very positive initiative in this direction. Yes, we have the NPTEL staff over here. Um, well, <laughs> first of all, every exam is an objective exam, okay? Because there is, there is nothing subjective that you can write in science, okay? <laughs> It, it, so every exam is essentially an objective exam. It doesn't necessarily mean that the questions will be fill in the blanks or take true or false kind of statement. So it will be a combination of those. And whenever students ask me this question, I always tell them that till I set the question paper, I will not know what the question paper will be like. And I think the student has to be ready for any kind of question. It will basically test what you have learned. So I don't think that that is a question which is, which one should even worry about. Uh, it is best to discourage students from raising such questions um, because they are actually asking for the question paper. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, let's not get into that. Um, it will, it, uh, usually it is a mix of, you know, different formats and uh, depending on uh, you know, whether you have one hour for the exam or two hours for the exam or three hours for the exam, we usually design a test which will be a mix of various formats. But that's just a matter of formatting a question because almost any question you can, you know, flip and format it in some other form. So that, that's an issue uh, which is just of formatting a question and seeking an answer. But all the questions will require an objective answer. <laughs> There's absolutely no doubt about it. Yes, any other question or comment? Yes. Yes. Well, write to them. Write to them. Your, uh, to them or to you? Uh, to them, because um, I mean, I mean, they look after the NPTEL administration, and if you write to me, I will forward your letter to them. So you're quite free to write to me as well. But essentially, yes, sure, sure. So, so any college which is interested in this should. Uh, write to NPTEL. If you write to me, I will get the answers from the NPTEL and they will be in the position to take a decision and then work out the logistics. But in principle, yes, uh, it is certainly possible for teachers to come down to your college and interact with the students directly. It's certainly possible. Details will depend on what uh, exactly the proposal is and so on. So I think that the devil is in the details. So let's let it come. 
But yes, I'm sure there will be a very positive response from the NPTEL. NPTEL is all about reaching out. So I'm sure that the NPTEL administration will do everything that is possible to make these courses and the instruction and the material which is generated become easily accessible to whoever wants it. So that's the whole philosophy of the program. So that the professors may Absolutely, yeah. And the range is of the quantum mechanics to spectroscopy was very nice. We teach CG coefficients and quantum mechanics. Yeah. Leave it as it is, and the next lecture, next program will be taking spectroscopy. He won't link that how the quantum has come into the spectroscopy. Yeah. Absolutely. They just start with G and the spectroscopy. Yeah. So it was a nice connection between quantum and spectroscopy. Very true. He said, "You have done it. Will be useful to the director, the teachers." Sure. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. They have to just go to the store. Absolutely. Yes. Deliver it properly. Yes. Sure. Make Absolutely. Love. Yeah. Thank you for arranging and making uh, knowledge about that some workshop is useful for the teachers. So we should take it. Thanks a lot for that. Well, thanks to NPTEL for yeah. providing the infrastructure and the facilities for that. So very thankful to all of you.